All right, I am going to record again. Uh, for starters, I think I'm on like a 30 day streak of videos right now. Don't get used to it because I'm gonna start work at some point, but it's probably longer than I've ever even streaked a girl on Snapchat because I don't talk to girls because I am a software engineer. So anyways, with that being said, I'm pretty burnt out, but uh, let's keep making videos because I am validation hungry and I have a fragile ego. It's park it time, baby. Here we go. Okay, park it. Well, basically in the past, or actually last video, I discussed Avro, Thrift, and Protocol Buffers, which are all ways of serializing data in a row-based format. So that's really useful for any type of time where you're going to be up uploading or you know retrieving a, a couple of rows of data at a time, right? And you want the entire row. However, as I've mentioned in the past, a very common use case in a lot of big companies is to basically be doing analytics processing. And when you do that, you want to be retrieving data that is basically from some set of columns in a huge, gigantic Hadoop table or SQL table or something along those lines. And as a result, it's very important to kind of have data locality in those columns. And so what Parkit basically is, is another library that actually goes and helps manage that, um, you know, storing of data in columns in a way that not only allows for more efficient querying of data within those columns, but in addition to that, reduces the IO of sending all of that data over the network by using some pretty cool compression techniques. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so Parkit, even though I mentioned column-oriented storage thus far, is really more of a hybrid-oriented storage. So let me discuss what that means. Well, we've spoken about row-oriented storage in the past, which is basically just saying, all the entries in a single row of data are stored together. And the issue with that is for analytics processing, where we really only care about you know, the values of one column over all the rows, that's pretty useless to us because we don't get data locality. We have column-oriented storage, which is basically where you're taking all of the rows in the table and storing the values of you know, the same column next to one another. So that's really nice for analytics processing, but it comes at the cost of if you're ever trying to do random accesses or maybe just trying to go ahead and put one row back together, all of those values from um, you know the same row are gonna be super far from one another on the disk, and as a result, having to do all those seeks is gonna take a really long time. So instead, we have this third approach called the hybrid model, where basically that involves going ahead and taking a table and splitting it, first of all, row-wise into you know, a bunch of different partitions, and then on each partition using column-oriented storage. So looking at the image below, imagine that we split between row two and row three, and then within that, we are using column-oriented storage. So A0, A1, and A2, since they're in the same column, are stored together. B0, B1, and B2, same deal. C0, C1, C2, also stored together. And then we start that partition and do the same exact thing for the latter three rows. Okay, so what is um, Parkit? How do we store the data? Why is it useful? Basically, here we go. Data is going to be split into these Parkit files, which contain multiple row groups, where row groups are basically those partitions that I just mentioned prior um, of those rows. So, you know, it might be three rows, it might be, you know, 100 rows. Probably it's going to be a pretty big amount of them because I think the default value for a row group is 128 megabytes worth of row data, which is actually quite a bit, but obviously if you're looking at a table that's gigabytes or terabytes in size, that gives you a lot of room to have a bunch of partitions. Um, additionally, each one of these Parkit files is going to have a footer, which contains some metadata pertaining to the information in the row groups. But basically within each row group, we obviously have a bunch of columns that we have to represent. And then within each of those columns, columns are broken down into chunks and even further into one megabyte pages. So the thing with these pages is that all of these pages are going to contain some metadata about the encoded data. So the encoded data is going to be, you know, that small amount of columnar data that's uh, local to one another. And so things that you might include in that, um, basically in that metadata section are something like a min or a max of that uh, data set, um, a count of the number of points in there, uh, possibly even a dictionary representing the elements of the data. And if you want like a more space efficient approximation of a dictionary, you could perhaps use a bloom filter. And that's something that was recently introduced to Parkit. But I'll explain in a little bit how that's all useful. Okay, so let's talk about data encoding. So imagine right now we have a list of values, right? And there are basically all the values in um, one column for a set of adjacent rows. Well, basically the naive implementation is to use a plane encoding where, you know, if all the data is the same length, you know, say it's like a timestamp or something and every timestamp is, I don't know, 20 digits, 
you can basically just go ahead and store the raw data without any limitations in terms of, you know, how long is the actual timestamp itself, because we know we can just run a loop over every 20 digits and then, you know, pull out our timestamp. Uh, that being said, if the data is of varying lengths, you know, maybe we're storing strings there instead of something like a timestamp, we can go ahead and first store an integer before every single um, string, basically representing the length of it, and then store the string itself. So that's how we would um, go ahead and decode that plain encoding. But that being said, the reality is we can generally do a lot better than this. The cool thing about columnar data is that generally speaking, A, there are a lot of duplicates because over one column, there just probably are going to be duplicates over all those rows. And then B is that if we have you know, duplicates that are adjacent to one another, as in we have a lot of repeated values next to one another, then we can really start to compress it. And we do this with dictionary compression, run length encoding, and bit packing. And I'll show this off in the next slide. So imagine we have the following columnar data that starts out on the left there. We have this uncompressed data of a bunch of strings of countries. And what we see here that within those strings of countries, we have a ton of duplicates, such that there are really only four unique values. Well, the first thing then that we would actually do is create a dictionary that goes ahead and gives each country a unique index in the dictionary. So now every time I see zero, I know that corresponds to the United States, one corresponds to France, and so on. And so I can actually take that uncompressed columnar data and replace every single one of those strings with an actual number, which I know takes a lot less space. Additionally, something cool that we can do with this dictionary is instead of using a full 64-bit number to represent each of these numbers, I can actually represent all of these numbers using just two bits. The reason for that is that there are only four entries in the dictionary, and as we know, just based on powers of two, I can represent four numbers using just two bits. So in that way, that's called bit packing, so we're able to save even more space there. Then finally, what we have is run length encoding. So this is really useful when we have not only just duplicate values, but duplicate values that are next to each other. So you can see there that in that final compression in the bottom right, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, comma 3, 1, and 0. And the reason that we're able to do 3, comma 3 and compress things further is the fact that there are three threes that are next to one another. So basically, we just go ahead and create a tuple that says the number of times that this number occurs and the actual number itself. So in this case, there are three consecutive threes, hence 3, comma 3. So that, this process allows us to hugely compress all of this data, which is really nice. And it gets even better if you know, we were to go ahead and pre-sort the data in some way that would um, allow us to compress this column even further. OK, so what about just like the chunk size? Because I mentioned that columns are split into chunks. And um, there are advantages and disadvantages to having big chunks and small chunks from each of these columns in a certain row space. So the first thing is that if chunks are too big, Basically, uh, dictionary compression is going to not work as well because we only have so much space to store our dictionary in. And so if there are too many values in that chunk, too many unique values, we can't fit them all in the dictionary. And so it, not only is it going to take more bits to represent each entry of the dictionary, but if we can't even fit every single value in the dictionary, then the values that can't be fit in the dictionary are just going to have to use plain encoding, and we're just going to have to store them as they were originally written. So we would get no benefit there. Hence, sometimes it's better to actually decrease the size of those chunks so that you can actually use a dictionary to represent all of the unique values of the columnar data in that chunk. Furthermore, however, it's not great to use overly small chunks, the reason being that I mentioned every single chunk has a metadata section. And if we have too many small chunks, we're going to end up storing a ton of metadata, and that incurs a lot of overhead in terms of the amount of disk space that we use and obviously the amount of um, basically information that we have to send over the network if we were to run like a batch process on this. Okay, so now we're actually going to talk about the metadata because this enables us to do something known as predicate pushdown. And this is actually a really useful feature of Parkit beyond just the encoding that I've talked about in perhaps past videos. So let's say we want to run a query over all of the rows of a given column. And so we basically want to say find all rows where some value x is greater than 69. Basically, we know that every single page has metadata telling us the min and the max of each row. So if we see that you know the min is 0 and the max is 20, we know we can skip over that entire chunk of data. And so this greatly allows us to speed up the process. 
and it's super useful to kind of have this metadata. Uh, additionally, in cases where um, we actually pre-sorted the data, like I mentioned before, this would allow us to skip even more stuff over because then, you know, our first chunk would have, say, values 0 to 2, the second chunk 2 to 4, the third chunk 3 to 6, and so, as a, or, or, sorry, uh, you know, 4 to 6, but the point is, that we could then skip over pretty much, you know, say the entire first half of the data and only start reading from the second half of the chunks because our sorted data is basically telling us there's nothing that we're interested in in the first half of all of this data. Another cool thing that we can do is instead of just um, looking at rows where, you know, we want a value greater than some threshold, if we're trying to find all rows where um, s some certain value is contained in that chunk, we can actually use the dictionary that is being used to compress the chunk to basically go ahead and tell us if a certain value is in a chunk. So, you know, like from our country's example before, if I wanted to find all the rows where, you know, country equals United States, I can see that United States is present in the dictionary for that chunk, and as a result, I know I can go ahead and check that chunk, and if I see the dictionary of a different chunk where United States is not in there, then I would go ahead and skip over that, thus saving me some processing time. Um, you may actually think to yourself, and this is a pretty cool thing, is that, oh, you know, if the dictionaries are taking up too much space, we don't actually want to keep track of all of those unique values. Um, one optimization that we could do here for a set approximation without taking up too much space would actually be to use a bloom filter. And that's something that's recently been supported by Parkit, and it is kind of an interesting optimization to see these come into play yet again in order to perform that set approximation for predicate pushdown. Um, and then furthermore, you can also partition the predicate file or the, the parquet files themselves because the parquet files can basically have um, directories and subdirectories. And so what you could do, for example, is say, you know, you have a bunch of uh, data corresponding to the dates. You could basically have all the data, um, all the columnar data corresponding to, say, like January 1st in one parquet file, and then all the columnar data corresponding to January 2nd in a different parquet file, and then that way you could further use that to enforce predicates, because if we only wanted the January 1st data, we could just check that parquet file, and thus that greatly reduces the amount of search or query time that we're actually going to be doing. Okay, so in conclusion, I know this was a pretty quick video, but Parkit is actually super useful in either a data warehousing or data lake situation in the sense that anytime you want to be performing a bunch of batch processes for either something like an ETL job or just analytics, being able to compress data stored in a column-oriented format as well as quickly query it using this extra metadata for predicate pushdown is super useful. Um, Parkit is extremely commonly used, um, like I mentioned, in data lakes, and you know there's a company called Databricks that basically is is you know heavily supporting the use of Parkit within their own data lakes, and as a result, Parkit is not something that is you know inherently um, a rival to Avro, Thrift, or protocol buffers, but in fact what you would do is you would use them in conjunction with one another, where you would first compress every single row using Avro, Thrift, or protocol buffers, and then taking that compressed row data, you could go ahead and use something like Parkit to uh, compress it in a column-wise manner. And that way you're making sure that you're um, incurring minimal network latency whenever you're doing these huge big data tasks because at the end of the day, generally speaking, it's faster to use CPU cycles to serialize and deserialize certain data, especially in a batch processing context, than it is to basically go ahead and send a bunch of crap over the network. Okay guys, I hope this one makes sense. A little mini video, but um, I'll be back tomorrow.